chief customer officer at Sky Hive, and, and this will come from British Columbia, from Vancouver. And then we will have a small, uh, a small panel at the end to finish uh, this event. So it's my great pleasure to introduce now the keynote of the conference. Uh, the keynote is by a very well-known person in human-computer interaction, uh, Ben Schneiderman. He's a emeritus professor uh, from University of Maryland. Uh, but now she's in, he's in Vancouver, so he's connecting also from Canada, so representing the West Coast. And uh, why invited him? Well, because he's uh, the author of this new book, Human Centered AI. So Ben, I, I need you to, to sign it at some point. <laughs> Whenever we see each other, I hope that happens. And uh, Ben has been one of the first persons uh, working on what to do to basically have responsible AI uh, software. Uh, he's a fellow of uh, the American Association uh, of, the uh, of Science, also of the ACM, of the IEEE, <coughs> Uh, the National Academy of Engineering and the Visualization Academy, and a member of the US, US National Academy of Engineering. So his work in uh, human computer interaction, his book in human computer interaction is really uh, well known. And today, uh, Ben will talk uh, about uh, basically a lot of contents from this book and probably uh, other recommendations that he has 15 recommendations to be <coughs> responsible. AI. So, Ben. Thank you for being here. Uh, welcome. The stage is yours. Uh, thank you, Rick. Uh, it's really impressive. You put together a terrific program today, and I appreciate the honor you've given me to be the keynote to open this event. Uh, <clears throat> I've always been impressed by Northeastern's outreach and working with industry, uh, its internship programs, and uh, I'm just very proud that one of my students, Cody Dunn, is on the faculty of Northeastern. Uh, so it's that pleasure that I begin with. So let me go to the... Okay. And there you go. I hope... <clears throat> so uh, the topic for today is human-centered AI, a term that I've chosen that I'd like to explain to you. And the central part of it is to ensure human control while increasing the levels of automation. So I'm always happy to wave the flag and represent the University of Maryland's Human Computer Interaction Lab, uh, which just held its 39th annual symposium, now on its ninth director, Jessica Vitak, an interdisciplinary community that's between computer science and the College of Information Studies, as well as other groups around campus, including the the wonderfully titled Maryland Institute for Technology and Humanities, MIF. Uh, you can visit our website to learn more and see a thousand tech reports, 200 videos, and all of our project reports. Uh, I hope some of you know me from my book, Designing the User Interface, now in sixth edition, uh, requiring five co-authors to tell the story of the remarkable impact of this modest-sized discipline on uh, the technology we use today from e-commerce to mobile devices and social media and so on. Uh, it lays the foundation for my thinking and I hope will be useful to you. But today our focus is on human-centered AI. And <clears throat> the question is, what do we mean by human-centered AI? Well, there's lots of parts to the definition, but I'd like to focus on the idea that we seek to amplify, augment, empower, and enhance people. That's the goal. It's not about the technology, it's human-centered, and therefore involves a set of processes uh, and goals and guidelines about how to make it a human-centered technology that focuses first on people, that uses uh, human-centered processes, participatory design, user testing, and the ways that uh, user experience design has been developed over the past 40 years, but now shifts it and applies it to the world of AI. It's a set of applications and guidelines that clarify that humans are in control, that machines are understandable, that their behavior is predictable, that we can get what we want done. So that's the story. Uh, there are three parts to this talk. 
The first is the HCAI framework, and then we'll move on to the design metaphors, and then we'll deal with the governance structures that make it possible to implement. So the HCI framework is a new way of thinking about design of technology. And so it goes back to 1986 with the first edition of my book, um, where there was a section called Balancing Automation and Human Control. And I was repeating the ideas that had been prevalent for 40 years, motivated by the work of Tom Sheridan. And he suggested that there was a single dimension of human control to computer automation. You could have low human control, a zero, uh, or you could have full computer automation, a 10, and that there were these 10 stages. And as a designer, you got to choose some point along this one-dimensional scale. And that implied a zero-sum game. <clears throat> that meant that if you increased automation, you necessarily reduced human control. And I bought into that. But over the years, I became less and less comfortable with that. As I looked at the examples of success stories of digital cameras, of uh, mobile apps, and so on, and I came to understand a new way of thinking. And that new way said we should work to ensure human control while increasing the level of automation. When I first wrote that, it was a little bit peculiar to me. I, even I couldn't get my hands around that. And I began to realize the way to think about it. And it meant that there were really two separate dimensions, that there could be low or high human control and low or high computer automation. <clears throat> and that story was published uh, in March 2020 in the International Journal of Human Computer Interaction. And the way I'd like to present it to you is a two-dimensional layout here. And it suggests there are four quadrants to think about. We usually think about high levels of, human, of computer control where a embedded pacemaker in your chest operates automatically. It's full computer control. And an airbag deployment in your car, which has to work within 200 milliseconds to be effective. No time for human intervention. And there are lots of examples that fit the, the situation of computer fully in control. But I came to realize there were places where full human control was what I wanted. Riding my bicycle, playing a piano, playing with children. These were places where you wanted to be creative, you wanted to be in control, you wanted to be you were responsible for the actions, and you wanted to be autonomous. So human autonomy became an equal goal to computer autonomy. The sweet spot of where we're going with many designs is to build reliable, safe, and trustworthy designs, such as in the common elevator, where there's a lot of AI in current elevator systems managing the flow of elevators and, uh, and optimizing performance. Yet, when you walk up and press the button, the light goes on and it shows you the elevator will be arriving soon. The door is open, you get inside, you press the sixth floor, the doors close, and you go first, second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth floor, the doors open and you're there. You got what you want. The, the impression you had was that you were fully in control, okay? Similarly, the digital camera, my favorite example. There's a high degree of AI built into the algorithms of digital cameras to manage the shutter and the focus and color balance and reduce hand jitter, many, many ways that AI gets put to work. But it is you who points the camera, who zooms in where you want, and then clicks for your decisive moment. It's your photo. You created it. You're in charge. And that's where we want to go. The preview of seeing what the picture will be like before you click is the essential feature that makes that so attractive. So those are the, the quadrants, and we'll be looking at examples of them. But there are dangers here because there can be excessive automation, as in the Boeing 737, where the designers felt they could so thoroughly, effectively make an autonomous system that the pilots did not even know that it was engaged. There was no visual display. There was no feedback. There was no obvious place where they could turn it off. It was excessive automation, which resulted in two tragic crashes that were deadly. 
On the other hand, we can also have excessive human control where people are put into danger. This has long been an understood problem in the world of human factors. And so designers have built interlocks or guards to prevent things from going wrong. In the simple case of a self-cleaning oven in many homes, if the temperature goes above 500 degrees Fahrenheit, 600 degrees Fahrenheit, the door can't be opened because the consequences would be quite severe. And so those kind of interlocks are built into a lot of systems, especially life critical uh, uh, systems of, uh, in transportation, medicine, and so on. So that's the basic idea. We can look at this two-dimensional quadrant, a two-dimensional layout, and let's you know apply it to the case of pain control. From the times of World War II, morphine drip bags with no automation were the standard. A plastic bag with morphine would drip, 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 drip in a regular way. And often this was very effective. But there were two dangers. <clears throat> there was too little morphine, in which case the patient would be in pain, or too much morphine, which would potentially kill the patient by slowing their breathing and heart rate. And so the automatic dispenser that measured human heart rate and uh, breathing rates was built to reduce the danger uh, of excessive morphine, but it did not allow the patient control. And so the movement went to patient guided dispenser where the patient had a trigger they could pull to get more morphine. But at the same time, the designers prevented excessive uh, morphine by limiting the number of times you could get uh, an extra dose of morphine on a, a per hour basis. So those were the, the strategies that opened up the doorways to new ideas. And the current directions are patient guided but clinician monitored systems where the patient can do uh, have control, but the clinician monitors performance. And in some hospitals, there's a central control room that may monitor 30 or 40 of these devices and collect the data about how performance is going so as to improve the algorithms for future users of these devices. Okay, so opening up our mind to this two dimensional thinking offers us new chances for creative design. One more example would be wheelchairs. The 100 year old heavy uh, wooden wheelchair was a push chair that required a caretaker. So no automation there. And then robotic ones, which automatically navigated to a destination, our hand powered and user guided ones, which allowed uh, <clears throat> some users to move on their wheelchairs on their own. And it led to creative variations such as wheelchair races and wheelchair basketball and so on. Uh, so that opens up the other possibilities. And the current directions are toward motorized, joystick controlled, but teleoperated and programmable so that we can ensure that the, the, the wheelchair is being used in a safe way and collect the data that will improve future uses of wheelchairs. So that's the first principle I want you to take away to open up your mind to thinking about this two dimensional layout where you can have low or high human control and low and high computer automation. The second part of this talk focuses on the design metaphors. First, just some philosophy. Um, my outlook says is aligned, let's say, with Margaret Bowden's that robots are simply not people. And Joanna Bryson says, humans, not robots, are responsible agents. And so this leads to three principles that guide the design of future systems. Human responsibility. Only humans are liable legally and morally. And so whatever technology is used, it's the human who's responsible for what happens. <clears throat> Second, computers have distinctive capabilities, sophisticated algorithms, huge databases, superhuman sensors, information abundant displays, and powerful effectors. And if we think about robots as people, we may miss the use of these distinctive capabilities. We'll take a look at some examples. Human creativity, the passion, empathy, humility, and intuition that people have is really distinct. I tend to celebrate what I see as the distinctive human capabilities. So this results in a rethinking of the language and the metaphors we use. 
the old language of intelligent agents or thinking machines, uh, and then teammates or collaborators, assured autonomy and social robots um, were what inspired a lot of people's participation in this kind of research. They're compelling ideas, they're charming, they're, they're attractive. However, I think they often lead to suboptimal designs. And so I've shifted my thinking and language to these new metaphors of super tools, AI infused super tools that extend human abilities and empower, empower users, of telebots that allow remote control and boost human perceptual or motor skills, of control centers that ensure human oversight and then active appliances. So these are new ways of thinking, but let's take a look at some of the examples of how they've worked out. I've already said my favorite example is of digital uh, cameras and you as a user have a high degree of control over the image that you select and the lighting and the focus um, and automation is provided and you get a high quality image. It used to be 30 years ago that only 10% of the population were experienced photographers who could reliably get a good picture. And now we have maybe 70% of the population who can reliably get a pretty good picture. Um, and these tools also are very social. They allow easy sharing of images. And so that's a good model for future designs of many systems. Similarly, navigation devices. Here I plotted a route from the White House, downtown of Washington, eight miles to College Park, where the University of Maryland is. And it gives me, through its AI machine learning algorithms, three choices and gives me current information about where the bottlenecks are and estimated times. And then I get to choose what I do. So it's AI providing opportunities, recommendations, and, <clears throat> and alternatives. And then I get to preview it and I get to go. Other applications, I type University of Maryland and I get many recommendations for uh, text or search auto completion, but I choose what I want. Spelling correction has the same idea, a gentle reminder that there may be a problem, a choice of an alternative, and then the user gets to decide what they want to do. And so the mantra here is preview first, then select and initiate when you're ready and then manage execution you can change the route you're going anytime you want during the trip you're not locked in you're in charge you're in control that's what i mean by a super tool a larger more ambitious one is the bloomberg terminal um, where bloomberg takes in 1.6 million articles per day and uses natural language processing AI algorithms to filter, organize, cluster, group them, and present them to the user in ways that enable them to get what they want done. Each user can tailor the choices that they get. There's a lot of information, but this design of a spatially stable and tiled, not overlap display gives you a user a great deal of control and very quickly they can scan from one to another, uh, get the information they want and take the actions that they need to take in a very rapid way. That's an effective idea. Uh, and that's why more than 350,000 people around the world pay more than $20,000 a year uh, to have a, something like this on their desktop. The idea of a Bloomberg terminal for medicine, for transportation has been spreading. We see active appliances um, moving out to the household, the Google Nest gives you increased control over the temperature in your house while maybe reducing energy consumption. The Roomba iRobot uh, I cleans your house. Uh, it's an automated device that I have and have been using for a long time and find to be useful. It has its problems, but it gives me uh, a better way of ensuring that the house remains clean. 
other devices around your house, dishwashers, clothes washers, are increasingly being filled with uh, AI algorithms, but you are in control. It tells you how much time is left. You can change, you can stop, you can take the, the, the shirt out to dry by hand. Uh, there's many changes you, you can make in the process of the use of these devices. Another one I mentioned, the pacemaker, which formerly had been seen as an autonomous device embedded in your chest, but now users can control the pacemaker to account for um, whether they're going to be active or, 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 or restful at certain times, they can change that. And at the same time, the physicians and the manufacturer can monitor tens of thousands of these devices and tailor their use better for different classes of users. And so that strategy of reliable, safe, and trustworthy that has different levels of control. The patient has local control, the manufacturer, or the physician may have control over longer periods of time. The class of telebots is yet another discussion issue. Some people will tell you that the Mars rovers are autonomous. Uh, and they are up to a point. They can automatically navigate around obstacles. They can avoid precipices. They can turn the solar panels to be optimally placed. They can turn the antennas to be pointing just in the right place. On the other hand, there are 80 people at NASA's Jet Propulsion Lab who control what's happening. They make longer term choices about what the missions are. They choose opportunities that arise that may be unexpected and they repair uh, the problems that may come up uh, with, uh, with the Mars rovers. And so this blend of a degree of autonomous action for rapid performance and then human control for others is a common strategy. It's the same thing in airplanes. The jet engines may operate autonomously on the, the speed of seconds and even minutes, but the pilots are in control over the directions of the flight and then ground controllers and airline managers make decisions about rerouting, et cetera. And so that balance of human and machine control is what we seek in many applications. Another important telebot story is the Da Vinci surgical system, where the manufacturer says on their webpage, robots don't perform surgery. They get that right. Your surgeon performs surgery with Da Vinci by using instruments that he or she guides via a console. And so while the journalists love to write the articles about how robot surgeons are better than human surgeons, really what they mean is that surgeons who use these advanced telebots are more effective in producing safe and successful surgeries. The control center idea is, is the, the, the fourth metaphor and the idea that um, these devices are being managed uh, at scale by central control centers here, a hospital center is becoming more and more common and well understood. Uh, here's a counterterrorism center. Again, people can be working together there's a great deal of information in these information abundant displays. They can plan missions. They can decide what to do. They can respond promptly and change the directions. And so, you know, this leads me to my central belief here, not humans in the loop, but humans in the group, computers in the loop. People are social. People want to work together. And so this bumper sticker tells the story. We need computers in the loop, but it's humans in the group that actually are the guiding force in successful applications. Okay, so that's the second principle of the design metaphors. And the third topic is governance structures, that there are many strategies needed to make the idea of AI algorithms successful. And I've put these into a diagram that shows four levels. And the core technical one of reliable systems are what happens in software engineering teams of three to, let's say, 15 people. Um, and we'll talk a little bit about the technical practices that these groups can engage with. But 
each team, there may be dozens of teams in a company, is guided by the safety culture of that company. And that requires leadership commitment to safety, the hiring and training of the right people, common frequent reviews of failures and near misses, open discussions of those problems, internal reviews of what's happening, and then industry standards that will guide their work. Each of the companies or organizations may be embedded in an industry. And there we see the idea of trustworthy certification by independent oversight. Uh, this is increasingly important where we see the rise of auditing firms like KPMG and Ernst & Young and PwC uh, as uh, firms that are taking on the role of auditing AI systems. Uh, as you may know, um, most publicly traded corporations are required to have internal audit committees and they're required to have external audits as well. The internal audits are effective and the external audits add a layer of protection and safety and prevention of fraud. And so we see that happening increasingly. Insurance companies are another uh, force for trustworthy certification. They've been effective in the building industries and medical care um, uh, and, and transportation. And now it seems like an opportunity to be involved in making sure that we have safe driving cars, not just self-driving cars, but safe driving cars. And the puzzle for insurance companies is whether they should charge more or charge less of insurance for those owners of self-driving cars. That's still being sorted out. We hope for having safe driving cars in the future uh, that will give us greater flexibility and reduce uh, accidents. That's the goal. How do we get there is really the question. NGOs, civil society, and professional societies also have roles to play. I won't have time to talk too much of them, but um, let me leave it here as further reading. Um, government regulation uh, is another possibility. Um, while industry sources may often complain about uh, regulation inhibiting innovation, it does not have to happen that way. Um, we have a history of regulation for automobile safety and for fuel efficiency, which triggered vast innovation in the field of automobile design and development. And now the automobile manufacturers are great enthusiasts and promote the safety and fuel efficiency of their cars. Um, we see this has happened also with the European GDPR <clears throat> regulations, which required explainability. And that movement began six or seven years ago and triggered tens of thousands of papers about explainable AI. And we're going to take a look at that idea in a little more depth here. I'll focus only on the team issues. There are five recommendations for the teams and then 10 more beyond that. But the five recommendations for software engineering teams are to add audit trails uh, to systems like the flight data recorders in aircraft, which have made civil aviation so safe. I think we need a flight data recorder for every robot or every AI system. And so that you could retrospectively review and analyze what's happened. Um, a related idea is the, is the incident support, incident reporting systems. Um, many drug, uh, the Food and Drug Administration in the US and many other countries uh, has a public site for reporting adverse drug reactions. And um, Sean McGregor's AI incident database already has 1,300 public reports of problems that have emerged in the implementation of AI systems. So those kind of tracking systems and audit trails will become an important part. New software engineering workflows have been proposed by Google and Microsoft and other companies. That's happening. The verification and validation process or testing is also being refined and tuned to the needs of using machine learning and, and deep learning algorithms. And then the bias testing to improve fairness, not only the study of um, the databases that are being used, but whether the results are really fair for users. This becomes important 
in life critical in decisions about parole, about hiring, uh, and uh, uh, other applications. We'll focus here on explainable user interfaces, and I'll take just a little time to give an example of how that might play out. Um, the literature on explainable user interfaces has focused almost entirely on retrospective explanations. And the question being whether those explanations should be local, discussing the needs of a particular user and their particular request, or global, explaining how the AI system works. Um, and while retrospective explanations may sometimes be effective, I must say I've had a hard time finding good examples of successful retrospective explanations. If you have some, please let me know. The new goal, I suggest, is to prevent the confusion and surprise that necessitates the use of an, ex of, of an explanation. So I'm looking for what I'll call prospective user interfaces that are interactive, visual, and exploratory. Let me give you an example. A common story, and here's a simple, very simple example of a post hoc or retrospective analysis. You enter a request for your mortgage. You want 375000 Your monthly income is, and your liquid assets are. You click on submit, and you get a result. You get a decision. We're sorry, your mortgage loan was not approved. You might be approved if you reduce the mortgage amount requested, increase your household monthly income, or increase your liquid assets. This is considered to be a pretty good retrospective or post hoc uh, um, uh, explanation because it focuses locally on the issues that you've uh, dealt with and it tells you a little bit about what you could do. Uh, you could reduce the mortgage amount, increase your household income, or increase your liquid assets, maybe by borrowing money from family members. However, it doesn't tell you how much. It doesn't tell you which one is the sensitive one. And so a better strategy might be this kind of visual sliders where you can adjust the amount you request for the mortgage. And if you move this slider to the left, you get more blue, your score goes up and gets closer to the score needed for approval. You can possibly increase your household monthly income, but that might be difficult for you to do. And then you could increase liquid assets by borrowing money from family members. If you move that to the right, you get more blue, you get closer. And with this kind of interactive exploratory interface, you can understand the sensitivity of the score to the three different variables. Yes, this is a small example of just three cases, but increasingly I'm finding applications on the web show this idea. Here's a playful one from a group of British librarians to make a recommender system for novels. Uh, there are a group of sliders and you can select up to four of them and you can slide from funny to serious, from beautiful to disgusting, from no sexual content to explicit sexual content, or from optimistic to bleak. And as you move these sliders, immediately the screen updates. And you get new, uh, new recommendations. So there's never a concern about why did that happen? You know why it happened, because you move the slider. Newspapers are adding sliders for control of politics, sports, and entertainment. You can get more or fewer recommendations of each category. And I think these are very powerful ideas that are spreading. And I've seen um, mortgage uh, application forms have these kind of sliders as well. So that's the story. And let me try to summarize. <clears throat> There's three principles I want you to take away. The first was the two-dimensional HCAI framework that shows low and high human control and low and high computer automation. Remember though, the dangers of excessive automation and excessive human control. And the goal being to get reliable, safe and trustworthy systems that gives users control, that make systems understandable and their performance predictable. The second idea is of changing the design metaphors and emphasizing the idea of AI-infused super tools 
telebots, control centers, and active appliances. The third idea is the set of governance structures. There are 15 recommendations in the early version of the paper presented in the ACM Transactions on <clears throat> Interactive Intelligence Systems and expanded on in the book. Uh, so those are the strategies that we'll take to embed AI algorithms in a social structure, in a management structure, where we can track the problems that appear and thereby promote continuous improvement that will reduce dangers to users. Ricardo kindly mentioned the book, um, and that's been my effort for the last few years to tell the story in a, a full way. It's gotten some very nice reviews. Um, in the UK, uh, Brian Clegg said it's one of the most important AI books in the last few years, which made me feel really good. And Forbes magazine, widely read management magazine, said excellent introduction, valuable to management who need to both understand how to better direct AI development and require appropriate AI to solve market and social challenges. Uh, and um, Virginia Dignam from Umea University says a tour de force, an increasingly important topic of human-centered AI, a must read. So these are guides for management, but also for researchers and for students to understand what it takes to make a system human-centered. The book has a, a, a framework for thinking about human-centered AI. We're guided by the basic ideas of supporting human values, of, of human rights, of social justice, uh, and of, of individual dignity. Those are really central to the thinking. But they manifest in the goals for uh, individuals, of promoting individual self-efficacy, not taking away uh, their, their control, supporting creative explorations, responsibility, and the necess necessary social connection. Remember, humans in the group, computers in a loop. And then the design aspirations, which are to go to reliable, safe, and trustworthy, the four levels I described of team, organization, industry, and government. The three parts I've mentioned here of framework, metaphors, and governance are central. But I want to add here in this discussion reminder that there are many, many classes of stakeholders. I list just five of them here. We often think of the researchers who are developing new AI systems, the developers who are building commercial systems, the business leaders who manage them, the policy makers who may have to regulate or set uh, standards uh, for their use. And then the vast number of users and the very diverse numbers of users. The context of use makes enormous difference. And so we have to appreciate that the user community is not just a unity, a, mon a monolithic crowd, but it's very diverse sub-communities, including users with disabilities and people with um, challenges um, coming from literacy and other limitations they may have. And we always have to keep in mind that there are threats to these designs. The malicious actors, the terrorists, the criminals, uh, those who promote misinformation and disinformation. Uh, we have to build our algorithms so as to prevent these, and we have to, we have to build our systems to monitor. So if these should arise, we, need, we can react quickly and limit their damage. We have to be aware of the dangers of bias, which would be promote unfairness to distinct classes of users. And the dangers certainly of flawed software that just doesn't work quite right. So that's the large framework. I just want to steer you if you want more. There's a weekly Google group, which I post on Wednesdays. Um, if you want to join that group, please do. There are more than 2,300 people on that. And, it, and um, it, it leads to uh, lively exchanges that come to me. And then each week I provide a summary of what's happened. We do have a Twitter account. Please follow us on Human Center AI, a Wikipedia page, and a website. So those will provide you with further information. And just remember in closing, 
the future is human centered. We want to build systems that enable people to be more effective, more powerful, and to get what they want in life. So that's the story. Thank you for your attention. And I'm glad to start with questions and look forward to a lively discussion. Thank you. Thank you, Ben. Uh, uh, great talk. Um, I already have many questions, but I believe that there are some questions from the audience. So let's start with those. Um, which everyday technology should we be most ethically concerned about? Where should we focus to make immediate progress? Good question. Um, I would say the most problematic are the social media, um, where misinformation and disinformation spread rapidly. And there are ways to limit that. I mean, certainly the bots, which may be a small number, as Elon Musk <laughs> suggests, but they, they are re responsible for a large number of the problems that appear. And so I think we should expect that Facebook and Twitter and other social media platforms do a much better job in limiting uh, dangerous content. I know this is difficult. I know that they have many people already at work on this, but we need a better solution to limit political interference, to limit hate um, and bullying and, uh, and, and the misinformation that can be so disruptive of, of social society. Now, the strategies here are not only to give the individual better control, that's often suggested, but most individuals can't don't have the knowledge time to take that kind of control. And so what we want to do is introduce intermediate structures and organizations that will enable them to take control. So if you are a reader of the Toronto Globe and Mail or the New York Times, you can appoint them as the editor for your social media. And they will then be able to choose which accounts to follow or not follow, and you'll align with those. You can make your own adjustments, but it should be possible to have powerful forces intervening to, uh, to make those kind of adjustments. So that's, I think, the, the number one concern I have. Thank you. So there is a question. Yeah, there's a second question that, the, that comes from London. Well, no, let's read this, this one first. Um, who do you think shall be held responsible, accountable if ethical AI does not perform ethically? <laughs> um, it, it, it's very clear that there is a human or an organization that's responsible. And so the important step, the predecessors, is two important steps. One is to clarify responsibility. The idea of suggesting that the machine is responsible is what's really dangerous here. Uh, we want to make clear who built this device, who's operating it, who's ma manage, managing it, who's maintaining it, and is there a way of getting in touch if you feel that the system is not performing ethically or, or, or properly. And so we have to tune this, as we have for all other technologies, we have a trace that goes back to the human source. The medical community is very aware of this, Hospitals have review boards. Uh, they, they, they track the performance of surgeons and physicians. Um, airlines similarly track carefully the performance of, of airplanes and pilots. And so we need to do the same thing. We need to have a better monitoring system of how uh, AI systems are performing. It's not enough just to build the algorithm. We have to embed it in a social structure, which gives uh, the... Uh, uh, you know, control over the continuing use because usage changes over time. And so that's what we have to understand. Thank so, you. So as we have uh, plenty of time for questions and we have already many questions, let, let me uh, go a little uh, further on, on this accountability issue. And, and, and let's remind the, the people in the audience <clears throat> what happened with the Uber when a self-driving car killed a woman in Arizona in 2018. Uh, in one week, Uber uh, basically settled with the family to make sure that they will not be sued. But the Arizona state had to uh, do something because a woman died in a public uh, road. 
and then uh, what was charged. Who was charged was the poor Hispanic woman that was as a backup uh, of the self-driving car because she was watching a video uh, because the car was wor working almost all the time until that time. And, and at the end, she was sentenced uh, to one year uh, at home without being able to get out. What do you think about, about uh, this case? Because uh, it doesn't look like the real, the real accountable uh, suffer much. Yes, I don't, I don't know that case. And thank you for telling me about it. Um, so, I mean, we'd have to have to look further, but you're saying that the woman who was in the self-driving car yeah, the person that was um, basically uh, as a backup, like if something happened, she had to take the wheel and do something, but she didn't do it in, in the accident because she was watching a video, so she was distracted. Yeah, so partially oh. she's liable, and mm -hmm. um, the companies who make self-driving cars like Tesla uh, do have a strong, clear message that the user has to keep their hands on the wheel, they have to pay attention. But their choice of language, of autopilot, and other ways they encourage, and Musk's use of the term full self-driving, uh, leads people to believe that it's uh, entirely safe to do it. And so mm -hmm. there's some real questions about responsibility on Tesla's part. I think Tesla's an impressive company. It's built an impressive system. But as you know, there are many dangers that happen and many crashes that have occurred. Um, the in the U.S., the National Highway Transportation Safety Administration began an investigation initially of 11 crashes of yeah. um, auto Tesla autopilot cars that crashed into standing vehicles of police, fire, and medical at the side or on the road, some resulting in deaths. There have now been more of such incidents, and various studies, some of them frightening, show you know how... Teslas do not avoid certain obstacles, and especially a standing car, an immobile car, um, it's less likely to see, uh, less likely to recognize. A car that's moving does work. Uh, you know, it does. It does stop. Uh, the front end, the collisions, uh, have been a successful part of of such systems lane following has been successful and the institute uh, the insurance institute for highway uh, safety uh, makes a very interesting point that the uh, collision avoidance systems um, do prevent more accidents so they are effective the lane following prevents more deaths because merging from a lane is a more deadly um, situation. So understanding the nuances of different situations is really an essential part. And that goes back to your question about the, um, who's responsible for uh, these, these accidents. The National Highway Transportation Safety Board investigated the 2016 uh, crash of a self-driving uh, Tesla car, which killed the driver because the car did not recognize that the fully white truck that was passing in front of it was not the sky and therefore the car slammed under the uh mm -hmm. the truck killing the, killing the driver in that case one of the 13 recommendations in that very readable 60 page report from the national transportation safety board in the u.s um, made the case that more thorough um audit trails to give a retros to give a more complete retrospective analysis would have been helpful. And I'd like to encourage as a research topic for students is the development of the rules for what is needed in an audit trail for different devices. It'll be very different for a self-driving car or a medical device. And so a deeper understanding is important. It's been a topic that the AI community has resisted getting into, uh, but I think it's a vital one and a really interesting opportunity. And similarly, I repeat my encouragement to look at the AI incident database uh, that Sean McGregor um, yeah. prepared, which is now gaining support and interest and visibility. And so that's yet another good model to follow for research projects to develop. But I think you're asking the right question. How do we determine responsibility in these circumstances? How much role do we put for the human operator? 
uh, who's involved for the designer, for the manufacturer, for the maintainer, and et cetera. So that's kind of the current discussions that are going on. Thank you. Yeah, so let's go to the next question because we have like many now, five or six. <clears throat> and, and just a data point on the Tesla accidents, all of the people that, that were killed uh, are men. So there's a <clears throat> correlation there. <laughs> uh, that's a dangerous question to get into. You yeah. might want to look at a website called tesladeaths.com tesladeaths.com, which um, is an open reporting system about deaths with Tesla cars. We don't know how many of them were autopilot involved, uh, but it's quite frightening. And the last time I looked, there were 240 such wow. deaths, not the five or six that are usually discussed. No. So there is an issue here. And then we have the near misses. There are hundreds of reports of Tesla's ramming into the you know garages because they didn't understand the garage as a different as a you know as a limitation and so uh and and there's other issues of inadvertent accelerations etc that are still being investigated so again my my encouragement is to think about the goal being safe driving cars not self-driving cars let's get them safe first let's build better highways better cars better mechanisms that allows safety and then we'll work our way towards self-driving which i think is a valuable idea but the goal for me is safe driving cars reducing the more than a million deaths from automobile accidents each year yeah, if we have time for that we, we can discuss this uh, yeah. a very important topic so next question please um, do we need new methods and tools in developing human-centered AI, or do we have sufficient resources in user experience and interaction design? Yes, I, I agree that user experience design um, strategies and participation, etc., are really good starting points. But what we need to get a better understanding of, how does the use of machine and deep learning algorithms change what we need to do? How does it mean that we have to look at other extreme cases? How do we evaluate the role of, of training data? How do we evolve the, how do we study the evolution of use cases? As systems get deployed, their usage changes over time. And so their safety may actually deteriorate rather than improve. And having the continuous monitoring for these systems with public reporting of incidents could lead us to, to better ways. So um, we're, the, 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 the new methods and tools are a new set of guidelines, a new set of ways of studying, new ways of reporting problems, and then the idea of investigations and public reporting uh, so that we have a common understanding. Those are the things I think will work. <clears throat> I should say will help. There'll never be a perfect system, but those are the strategies that could lead to improvements. Another question, when talking about AI integration and tool product design, in order to achieve both high automation and high human control, what are the key elements to take into account? Okay, um, I would say, uh, and I've written a short piece on the National Academy of Engineering uh, perspectives website, which details this issue. So I think the way to do it is not, is, is to break down the problem into many smaller problems. So if we take self-driving cars, well, there are many, 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 many subtasks. So we can think about setting the destination, choosing the route, allowing control over speed. That is someone may be in a rush and may want to have the self-driving car go more quickly. And what are the ways in which they should be allowed to do that or shouldn't? What should be the limitations uh, on speed, for example? Uh, should we allow, under what circumstances should we allow a car to drive more than 10 kilometers per hour above the speed limit? If someone's needing to get to a hospital, maybe that's justification. How do we allow those kind of, uh, those, those shifts? Um, other things we can have, uh, if, we, if we focus on specific tasks like self-parking, okay, we could allow the user to self-park. That is, they pull up to an empty spot 
and the car self-parks. We could allow even more imaginative notions, the idea that we have self-parking garages where you pull up to the garage, you step out, and the car proceeds to find its own space to park. And then when you return, the car repairs for you automatically. So there's a wider range of choices than we've been taught about in the past. And I think that's what I wanted to do is opening the door towards more design possibilities. Um, what are differences between explainable AI and responsible AI? Oh my, well, we have about 30 different terms about explainable and responsible, mm -hmm. uh, auditable, um, certifiable, there's about 30 terms that have been dependable, re resilient, et cetera, et cetera. It's very hard to separate out these, these definitions. Uh, I would say for me, explainable AI has to do with the design of the user interface that gives people control over what's happening and limits the need for explanations. Okay. So that the checkout process in Amazon, a lot of AI, but you get step-by-step -step movement or TurboTax for preparing taxes. These are complex processes, but they're step-by-step. -step, and that I think is the strategy. Now, responsible AI to me deals much more with the social and management structure that you build around it. And so uh, that's what I see. And I've, I've enumerated a number of those strategies, but I particularly maybe I should emphasize the idea of independent oversight. Mm -hmm. This occurs in many industries, whether it's pharmaceutical manufacturing or, or food production. We do have continuous oversight over, over the use of these systems. And so that's a way of building responsibility in. Uh, we also have two other forms of oversight. I've mentioned retrospective oversight for accidents. So most nations have a uh, a, a transportation safety board that reviews serious accidents of airplanes, boats, or trains. And that's the second kind. So the retrospective, the continuous, and then the planning oversight <clears throat> for building construction. This is well established of local zoning boards and planning councils that before you build a building, okay, you come with a plan and there's an open discussion about the plan. OK, then you may make adjustments. Your plan is approved. You build the building. The building inspector mm -hmm. arrives. You get a certificate of occupancy and now you can get insurance. So there's a responsible chain of many people in many places for intervention. Now, that could work for AI systems that are large scale systems like of a major bank. <clears throat> a TD Bank puts in a new mortgage system. There might be a planning process by which it's reviewed, just as city planning processes review development pl plans. And eventually we'd have a, a set of expectations and understanding about how we can make that process still more safe and reliable. So responsible AI to me has uh, a, a wider social structure, legal structure, and deliberation process that enforces independent oversight. Thank you, Ben. Uh, for us, in the context of this event, the responsible AI is everything. And then explainable AI is just one tool that, that can be helpful to achieve responsible AI. So next I question. agree. Another question. Is there a particular source of ethical standards, <clears throat> utilitarian approach, rights, fairness, justice, common good, virtue, et cetera. Ben, ben if you yeah. want, we can delay this question for Jan Su Jansa, that is an ethics. <laughs> yeah, I, um, sure. I will say ethical discussions are a good, um, are, are, a, are a good discussion basis. However, for me, ethical foundations are a necessary part for design thinking. For mm -hmm. me, design is where it happens. That's mm -hmm. where the choices are made between how it's implemented, what's on the screen, how it's tracked, what the user sees, what the managers see. And so I'm happy for ethical discussions, but I'm really eager for design discussions. That's where it happens. Yeah, that's the uh, ethics uh, 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 in practice. So yeah, the second part maybe. Um... <clears throat> 
would you say what would you say is the best way to take when building response the best way i think i'm coming to understand actually there's no one best way i've begun to make a taxonomy of different ai applications mm -hmm. and there's a very different set of principles for life critical applications in medicine or transportation from the considerations of creativity support tools like digital cameras, which are personal use items, and still different from the social platforms of Facebook and Twitter and so on. Um, and so I don't think we want to, I think the research issues are first to make a taxonomy of AI applications, then look at the consequences uh, of them. And so people have suggested that the framework that I showed in the beginning, the two-dimensional framework for AI of low to high human control and low to high machine control should actually be a three-dimensional, that the third dimension should be the severity of impact of, of uh, applications. And where there is greater danger for harm, you need to have more careful principles uh, for building responsible and ethical AI. So we need to, we're moving from the early days of AI, which think of it as an algorithm, a way, the best way to an, a more nuanced understanding that there's very different practices and very different applications. So we have a couple of questions. I'm not sure if we can uh, answer both very quickly. We have only three minutes left. What so, kind of explainable AI tools, techniques are needed to help human-centered AI? I think I've said very clearly that I want to shift from retrospective explanations, which can be effective, but are very difficult to do. And 30 years ago, um, the knowledge-based expert systems face the same problem and retrospective explanations just didn't work. But prospective business rule systems began to make that a success story. Similarly, in the world of HCI, the idea of ex explanations and of online um, tools shifted towards the minimal manual idea that Jack Carroll proposed of having just uh, a progressive series of steps and user control to allow exploration to move backward and forward in the process. And so um, the, the kind of tools I want are ones that prevent the need for explanations, that make it so clear as you're moving through the steps of what's happening, that explanations are not needed or rarely needed. So last question in one minute, Ben. Let's see if we can have the last question. Long question. Many of the negative effects of technology come with it scaling up. It can work well for individual users, yes. But when scaled up for huge numbers, it lead to a very negative. How can such negative social effects be predicted? Uh, who should be doing? Well, the scaling up and the large number of users indicates there's a very diverse, a greater diversity of users. The tests of systems with small numbers of homogeneous users will give you some help, but what you then need to understand is how it works for users with disability, users with um, uh, different uh, skills, literacies, language, ethnic backgrounds, cultural backgrounds. There's a great diversity of individuals. And so the, the, the continuous tracking and monitoring of adverse events is what will be necessary. Uh, adverse events will happen but we have to make sure they happen only once and that we can, 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 can change them. I see the questions from Julita Vasileva. Very pleased to see you online. Yeah, Thank this you. question is coming from Saskatchewan. So we have yes. uh, this, another province mentioned and uh, we don't have for time for more questions. So I, I wanted to ask you uh, if the lack, so you mentioned humility at some point, maybe the lack of that we uh, <laughs> implies all the hype we have <laughs> on AI. But sadly, we don't have time to discuss that. And, and it was a great presentation, Ben. Thank you for being with us today. And I look forward to more of your work. Thank you, Ricardo. I really appreciate the opportunity. This is a very important topic, and you've taken a strong lead in making this making this happen in a in a big way. Yeah, and the uh, FEM will soon publish a, a new version of the of the principles for software that basically will complement your work. Thank you. 
Thank you.